Welcome back. Today, I'm really excited to tell you about kind of this concept of sparsity and compression and specifically address the question of why natural signals are so compressible. Audio signals, images, streaming television, all of these signals are massively, massively compressible. Right now, you are watching this video. This is being streamed in a compressed format from Google servers directly to your screen, okay? And why is the world so compressible? That's the question we're gonna ask today. This is one of my favorites. I'm super excited uh, to tell you about this. It's surprisingly related to uh, the age-old question of if you had a room full of monkeys banging on typewriters, would they eventually come up with the complete works of Shakespeare? Okay, so that's it's closely related to this idea of, of uh, compressibility and the rarity of natural signals that we care about, images and audio and, and, and written books and, and texts, the rarity of those structured signals in the vast, vast space of randomness uh, that is possible, okay? And one of the reasons this is uh, among my favorite lectures to give is because it involves massively big numbers. And ever since I was a really small kid, I loved thinking about big, big numbers, okay? And here we're gonna talk about some of the biggest numbers uh, you're going to experience in your, your daily lives, okay? So we're gonna start with a thought experiment. We're going to imagine that we have uh, images that are really, really crude, okay? So we're gonna have 20 by 20, so 20 by 20 black and white images. So all that you can have are zeros and ones telling you if your pixel is black or white in a 20 by 20 grid. Okay, so I'm not gonna draw the exact 20 by 20 grid, but it's pretty, you know, it's a pretty coarse grid of pixels. How many possible images in this 20 by 20 black and white pixel space can you have? Okay. This is a question that is pretty uh, pretty easy to answer if you're familiar with, uh, with, with powers, okay? So in each pixel, you have two choices, black and white, and there are 20 times 20, or 400 pixels. So you have two to the power 400 possible black and white 20 by 20 images. This is bigger than the 10 to the 80 nucleons in the known universe nucleons in the universe. And so what that tells you is that even these silly little 20 by 20 images, you could barely draw a smiley face or a peace sign or something like that in this tiny little image space. Even those images have more possible images than there are nucleons in the known universe. This is larger than astronomical, how big this pixel space is, okay? And so imagine that instead of this dinky little pixel space, now we have full megapixel space. And instead of black and white, you know, zeros or ones, you have full color depth. You have, you know, thousands or millions of choices of the color uh, and the, you know, brightness and saturation at every single one of those million pixels. Now you have something like thousands or millions to the power millions. And every year, you know, your phone has more and more pixels in its camera, more megapixels. This space of images, this pixel space, is almost mind-bogglingly large. It is so obscenely large how large this pixel space is, it's hard to even fathom. Even this 20 by 20 pixel space is bigger than the universe. This pixel space is, is vast beyond imagination. And I wanna kind of take you down this road of how big this space is and why this is at least going to give us some hint of why pictures are so compressible, or at least pictures we care about, okay? so. The space of pictures of what we're gonna call natural images, now natural doesn't mean pictures of streams and mountains and goats and things like that. It also means everything you'd ever see, like this pen or a coffee cup or this picture that you're seeing on your screen right now of me talking to you or there's a picture of you looking at your screen. There's a picture of you being born. Whether or not someone took that picture, it exists in natural image space. There's a picture of you being born from every possible camera angle. There's a picture of every moment of your entire life that lives inside of this image space. So this natural image space of, of things you would ever see with your eyes is also vast beyond imagining. It encapsulates everything you will experience, at least in megapixel resolution, uh, in your life from every camera angle. 
Okay, so, so your natural image space is huge, but pixel space is huger. It's even bigger than your whole experience and everything you could experience uh, and things you can't even imagine experiencing. Pixel space is bigger. And here's why. If you randomly drew an image from pixel space, if you just randomly put values in for every single pixel, and you do this over and over and over again a million times, a billion times, a trillion times, you will only ever get TV static. Stuff like this that looks like white noise. For my younger viewers, TV static uh, is what happened when you used to turn your TV on and you didn't have a channel. It didn't turn blue. Uh, it turned into this kind of pixelated, snowy, fuzzy, white noise. That's, that's, the, that's the basic signal of the universe. If you just randomly pulled an image from pixel space, you get TV static. And you could do that over and over and over again from now until the end of time, and you will only ever get random noise in a megapixel image space. You'll never randomly assign bits and get a coffee cup or a picture of a dog or a hurricane or something structured that humans care about. So these are two big concepts. Our world of pictures we care about is vast. It encompasses everything you could possibly take a megapixel image of that you would care about. But the space that it lives in, the natural, the, the, the pixel space that natural images live inside of is so much bigger that natural images occupy a minuscule, tiny fraction, a, a tiny corner of, of this possible pixel space. Okay, And so that gives you this idea that even though this space is huge, a lot of the pixels we use, a lot of those million pixels or, or more that we use to represent those natural images are somehow redundant because they are also giving us the flexibility of coding this even vaster space of randomness that our natural images live inside of. And so that basic redundancy, the fact that our natural image space is a tiny, tiny, almost immeasurable fraction of pixel space, is what allows us to compress and to find other representations where these images are sparser or can be described with less numbers, less than a million numbers. Because most of those million numbers, those degrees of freedom, those pixels, are allowing you to code up this pixel space also, this random white noise. Okay, So that's at least how I think about this. Uh, the vastness of image space uh, is, is how I think about compression and why signals are compressible. Now, I said that these images, these natural images, live in a tiny corner of pixel space. That's not entirely true. If, it, if they lived in a little corner of pixel space, then we would just go to that corner, and we would only look there to represent our images, and we'd get really, really good compression for free. We'd know exactly what to measure to get those images. What really happens is that natural images live in this kind of spider web space spread throughout this extremely high dimensional, million dimensional megapixel image space. There are these like gossamer spiderweb threads. Maybe there's this thread over here that looks like trees and a thread over here that looks like dogs. And you know, it's all connected, but it doesn't live in one corner. It is immeasurably thin web of natural images inside of pixel space though. Okay. Now, again, this is kind of philosophical stuff. Um, this might actually sound familiar to you. So uh, Borges, in his uh, famous uh, book, Labyrinths, writes about the, uh, the library of Babel. It's this kind of thought experiment that he ran where he had this infinite library with these hexagonal carols. And inside of these, every single book that could possibly be written was written. So his book, this Labyrinth, was on that shelf. And next to it was another copy of Labyrinth with one letter changed. And millions and trillions and quadrillions of copies of this book with just small variations filled carol after carol in this hexagonal pattern onto infinity. Okay, it's this beautiful concept. This is Borges uh, kind of wrestling with this idea of the infinite. And his conception of the infinite is basically book space. Okay, so we have pixel space. He was thinking about book space. You could think about audio space. Um, even this goes all the way back to Aristotle. Aristotle was talking about how if you kind of you know randomly dropped all of the Greek letters, you had a huge collection of, of Greek letters made of gold, and you drop these on the city streets, would they ever randomly fall into a sentence or a poem or something that made sense to humans? Okay, so people have been wrestling with this concept of the infinite and the vastness of signal space for millennia. 
And now with advances in applied math and statistics and optimization, we're finally starting to understand kind of where our natural images live inside of these, uh, this image space and where our signals live in signal space. Um, so I want you to think about, you know, kind of where you stand on this. If you had enough monkeys banging on typewriters for long enough, uh, you know, would they ever come up with this kind of corner of signal space that actually matters to us humans? Okay, so we're going to talk more about this. We're especially going to exploit this for compression ourselves. We're going to, the fact that these natural images are somehow special in this uh, nearly infinite signal space, we're going to exploit that structure and we're going to use that uh, for, for compression and we're going to use that in the context of sparsity. All right, thank you.